SCP-5956, The Rhizno Cannon. The sci-fi concept of using a time machine to save someone you love is a fairly old one, with it being the focus of many time travel stories. Sometimes it works out, but often the time traveler learns an unfortunate lesson in trying to change the past. The SCP we'll be looking at today is another similar time manipulation story, one based around horrible catastrophes that some people wish desperately were preventable. Time may be a flat circle, but this one is certainly a big bump in the road. Let's take a look. We're first informed that the document we're reading is from the Prime Timeline, and is being read by director Ilsa Reinders, the current director of Temporal Anomalies. It has the rather unique object class of Antithesis meaning an anomaly that must be used even though that usage prevents its own containment and the containment of other anomalies. SCP-5956 is the Rhizno Canon, which stands for Retrocausally Engineered Intertemporal Synchronization of Noetic Ordinality. It is a temporal manipulation mechanism that allows for the synchronization of one's consciousness at two distinct points in time. In other words, it allows someone to communicate with other versions of oneself, augmenting their own knowledge and experience. It is not known to generate new timelines, and any attempts to alter past events using the device are virtually certain to cause temporal paradoxes resulting in catastrophic timeline collapses. Instead, it is used to initiate causal loops, which have already partially occurred, although by definition, the Rhizno Cannon cannot initiate any causal loop, as its activation is spurred by the events which it allows to occur. As usual, time manipulation is a little weird. A known side effect of the usage of the Rhizno Cannon is the inability for one's past self to recall interactions with one's future self. Once the link created by the Cannon is severed, the past self is subject to an anti-memetic phenomenon that causes them to forget crossing their own timeline. This effect is believed to be a fundamental principle of intertemporal self-interaction, as it naturally decreases the likelihood of potential paradoxes. One's past self does not retain any knowledge which might cause them to act unwisely without their future self's supervision. We're provided with a list of the only safe instructions for utilizing the Rhizno Cannon, starting with the past and future self becoming synced, and the future self providing a set of instructions. The past self then fulfills those instructions, taking care to transcribe them precisely. Afterwards, the two become desynced, and the past self gradually forgets their interactions, eventually becoming their future self after enough time. The Temporal Anomalies Department then notifies the future self that they must contact their past self, as per the original interaction. The future self then activates the Rhizno Cannon syncing themselves with their past self and providing them the transcribed instructions, ensuring that they transcribe those same instructions and fulfill them. Finally, the future self deactivates the Rhizno Cannon, retaining their memory of this interaction. To summarize all that, an individual is contacted by their future self, and then they and the Temporal Anomalies Department have to do a number of things to ensure that no paradoxes occur with that interaction. The Rhizno Cannon was initially discovered on November 23rd, 2020, when Dr. Daniel Sokolsky of Site-43 commissioned Dr. Placeholder McDoctorate of Site-87 to construct the Rhizno Cannon for use in a high-clearance covert operation. As it turns out, however, Placeholder was found to have already been constructing the device, claiming to be presently synchronized with his future self who had been instructing him to build the cannon for several weeks. Upon completion, it was relocated to Site-120 due to anomalous energy requirements, after which Placeholder desynced from his future self and subsequently forgot the entire interaction. 
Now, placeholder must be instructed by the Temporal Anomalies Department to activate the device on January 1st, 2034, to fulfill the loop. With that, we're given a new file related to the canon, this one being from timeline 5956-X, known as the Paradox Timeline. The file is about SCP-001, in which the containment procedures state that it is a paradox-induced recurrent catastrophic containment failure, and thus it is contained through amelioration of its effects on relevant timelines. Every year, on September 8th, a number of specific actions must take place at Site 43, timed down to the second. First, Dr. Dougal Deering must be informed of his containment duties, and one keeper of SCP-001-B must be present. Deering must then activate the Rhizno Cannon and contact his Prime Timeline counterpart at precisely this moment in 2002, telling him that there is no cannon. He must then request possession of SCP-001-B, followed by administering an immediately lethal cognito hazard to himself. After this, Agent Radcliffe must not respond to his radio, and Dr. Del Olmo must radio Director Lillehammer and say that something's wrong. Chief Mukami must then activate the bulkhead seal on facility AAF-D, with all of the personnel still inside, followed by sounding the evacuation order for the security and containment, applied occultism, and archives and revision sections. Agent Radcliffe must still not respond to his radio, as Mukami activates the bulkhead seals on the same sections, with all personnel still inside. Dr. Markey must then engage the Interitis Protocol, destroying the Euclid and Keter-class wings of the security and containment section, and Radcliffe must finally respond to his radio by saying, Please tell me you're not still in there. Chief Ambrogi will then seal the intersectional subway system and engage the vacuum flush mechanism, followed by Dr. Wirth crawling beneath his desk and manually triggering the controlled burning of the archives and revision section. Agent Radcliffe will respond to his radio again by saying that the concentration cell should be safe, and it's just north down that hallway. Chief Wilhelm will then order three MTFs to engage the spectral entities at facility AAF-A. -A. Dr. Del Omo will broadcast stun memetics to all surviving personnel in the applied occultism and archives and revision sections, and finally Chief Mukami will direct security and containment forces to neutralize all site personnel within those sections, except for Dr. Wirth. All told, nine personnel must perish during these events, and any individuals terminated by new occurrences of SCP-001 will be added to that list. SCP-001 is described as an annual cascade containment breach slash anomalously stable temporal paradox, occurring in the acroomatic abatement, applied occultism, archives and revision, and security and containment sections of Site-43. Dramatic local reality alterations will revive and subsequently terminate nine deceased Foundation personnel, and damage containment apparatus throughout the site. This began on September 8, 2002, when Dr. Deering telepathically received a set of instructions from a future version of himself in an alternate timeline. He was instructed to transcribe and record the entire conversation, manually shut all esoteric effluence valves voiding into acromatic abatement facility AAF-D, notify janitorial and maintenance personnel of a critical buildup of esoteric substances which would result in a catastrophic containment failure if left untreated, and finally ensure that AAF-D be fully decommissioned. He was also instructed in 20 years' time to retrieve a device constructed by placeholder known as the Rhizno Cannon, using it to contact the present version of himself and repeat the instructions he had been given precisely, ensuring a stable time loop and preventing the catastrophic containment failure from happening. 
After the connection was severed, Deering's recollection of the event soon began to fade, but he was able to execute the instructions given. He promptly detected a problem in facility AAF-D, executing an emergency flush into adjacent facilities and preventing a catastrophic containment breach. After further risk evaluation by Deering, facility AAF-D was officially condemned, but during a routine inspection prior to its decommissioning, a loaded spectral grounding conduit burst, boiling 14 personnel alive. Afterwards, the seven Site-43 senior staff members supervising the decommissioning met in honor of the lost personnel, and they expect to meet again every 10 years in remembrance. For 20 years, no further acromatic abatement-related incidents occurred. In the days before September 8, 2022, Dr. Deering placed a request to Site-120, asking that the Rhizno cannon be transported to Site-43 for use in a demonstration of temporal mechanics. However, on the day of, while preparing to fulfill his latter set of instructions, he was informed that neither the device nor any trace of its existence could be found. What followed was the creation of a serious temporal paradox via poorly considered timeline manipulation. Deering's actions on September 8, 2002 had somehow retroactively erased the Rhizno cannon he had used to undertake them, resulting in a paradox that initiated a wave front of malignant, causal, temporal, and narrative energy. If left unchecked, it would likely have resulted in the catastrophic restructuring of universal reality. However, since this originated at Acromatic Abatement Facility AAF-D, the wavefront of paradoxical energy reacted with residual esoteric material in the decommissioned facility, resulting in a much more concentrated effect instead. AAF-D was immediately reverted to its 2002 configuration, including its full payload of esoteric material, its backlinks to all other abatement facilities, and the problems still present that led to its decommissioning in the first place. The resultant explosive reaction between the paradoxical energy and the esoteric material led to a number of anomalous effects. First was the retroactive and asymmetrical erasure of an unknown entity that's known only in vague references in Foundation documentation as a being called the Unyielding. Other effects include increases and decreases in the number of perceptible temporal dimensions, spontaneous and exclusively red monochromacy, dermal procession, apparition of extratemporal entities, chronological inversion, noogenesis in reflective objects, multiple sets of extrasensory perceptions, total linguistic and communicative failure, Condensation of vaporous substances resulting in sharp temperature increase, nadiriosis, and silurea. Just prior to the incident, Dr. Del Olmo was interviewing an SCP object in the security and containment section, although since this entity's existence has apparently been erased by the events, he is unable to recall the exact nature of their conversation. He did, however, leave the chamber convinced that a containment breach attempt was imminent, and went to radio Dr. Lillehammer to convey his suspicions. The seven senior staff members who had supervised AAF-D's initial decommissioning were engaged in their memorial activities when the breach occurred, and were immediately alerted to the Paradox wavefront by the sudden transformation of their surroundings. Lillehammer radioed the officer on duty outside the facility. Radcliffe for a status update, but as he had misplaced his radio, he did not receive the transmission. Dr. Okori then opened the hood on an Orphic outflow pipe for an inspection, reporting that a catastrophic thomic event was now imminent, the safety shielding around the pipe had become porous, and her death was likely also imminent. She then removed her hand from the pipe and attempted to move away from the other members of the group, but her muscle mass passed directly through her skin, carrying most of her skeletal structure and organs with it, collapsing into a pile of viscera. 
her skin remained standing. The voice of Dr. Del Olmo then erupted from Lillehammer's radio at a volume high enough to cause permanent hearing damage, declaring that something's wrong. This coincided with the collapse of Dr. Okori's dermal layer, and a series of audiovisual anomalies indicating the beginning of a mass containment failure in AAF-D. Dr. Weddell, startled by the bursts of sound, stumbled backward and struck a wall. His body cascaded outward along the surface of the wall until it was textured with his clothing and physical features, at which point he began to scream, never ceasing to scream for the duration of the whole event. Lillehammer radioed security and containment, ordering that the AAF-D bulkhead be sealed, and Chief Mukami carried out this instruction immediately, as well as ordering the evacuation of all workspaces in the vicinity of AAF-D. At this point, narrative energy emanating from AAF-D reached the anomalous document storage lockers in the Archives and Revisions section, resulting in the spontaneous manifestation of hundreds of small-scale thought forms, which constructed their physical forms from the section's extensive collection of printed records. As local reality collapsed, Lillehammer again radioed Del Olmo to seek advice on the safest location within the facility to take shelter, but when Del Olmo didn't respond, as his radio had been transformed into glass, Lillehammer radioed Radcliffe again. He had still not located his own radio, however. Dr. Blank physically accosted Dr. McInnes and accused him of causing the present calamity with his incompetence in 2002 and former chief Nasimbeni was attempting to put himself between them when a rapid superstructural change filled the space he was occupying with a load-bearing member, pulverizing his internal organs and killing him instantly. Chief Mukami then sealed the archives and revision section, receiving reports that all security and containment staff in the containment wings above applied occultism and all applied occultism staff had been showered in Orphic outflow and converted to liquiform entities. These entities were presently engaged in breaching containment for all surviving Euclid and Keter class anomalies, while simultaneously two containment chambers were obliterated by spectral superheating and their supposed occupants retrocausally erased from reality. Chief Mukami activated the bulkhead seals for these two sections as well, and containment specialist Dr. Marquis concluded that the captive anomalies could not be allowed to become compromised by the transmogrified staff, enacting the Interitis Protocol. Shaped charges obliterated the containment chambers and their occupants, dealing considerable structural damage to the site as a whole. Agent Radcliffe finally recovered his radio, noting the two missed transmissions from Lillehammer, and he attempted to contact her. His message was not received, however, as upon entering the facility, the radio wave took physical form and began pinging off of the remaining intact abatement apparatus, setting off a series of explosions throughout the facility. Janitorial and maintenance chief Ambrogi became aware that AAF-D's sealed intersectional subway station had become unsealed, and the subway was filling with a miasma of recondite material. He shut down the system and engaged the vacuum flush mechanism, forcing the material down the line to the venting mechanism at facility AAF-A on the Lake Huron coast. The vents immediately solidified into a mass of human bone, and AAF-A itself soon filled with recondite material suffocating all personnel in that facility within one minute. Chief Ibanez stepped into the path of a warm gust of air and inexplicably froze. When Lillehammer attempted to push her out of the way, Ibanez's body became elastic, wrapping around Lillehammer like a large rubber balloon before bursting, covering her in bodily fluids. Dr. Blank collapsed against a wall, sobbing uncontrollably. The thought forms in a &R had now achieved complete canonization, fusing into a single pataphysical construct 
composed primarily of paper mache newsprint tentacles, and it proceeded to expand its body mass by consuming the clothing worn by A&R personnel after converting their bodies into a slurry of organic material. This slurry remained mobile, emitting vocalizations consistent with extreme distress and or arousal. Dr. Wirth retreated to his private office, hid under his desk, and activated the pyroclastic charges beneath a &R, immediately incinerating the paper-based thought forms. Dr. Wirth survived the damage, as his metal desk was shielded from the worst effects of the fire when a solid cloud of ash covered it. A being resembling Dr. Weddle then approached the senior staff in AAF-D, carrying an SNC service weapon, while the real Dr. Weddle's screams could still be heard emanating from the walls. The entity spoke to Dr. McInnes, telling him that he did the best he could, it wasn't his fault, and nobody blames him, and that they'll fix this together. It then pointed the weapon at McInnes and pulled the trigger, causing his corpse to fall to the ground and disappear, along with the apparition of Dr. Weddle. Lillehammer and Blank then resumed their flight through AAF-D. Agent Radcliffe received Lillehammer's latest plea for help and successfully responded, advising her and Blank to take cover in the AAF-D concentration cell, which was equipped with high-effectiveness abatement devices. He provided them with accurate instructions for reaching the cell, unaware that the entire facility had just undergone a Euclidean shift and reversed its cardinal directions. The pursuit and suppression section was dispatched to AAF-A to inspect the compromised facility, finding it to be empty. One kilometer away, at Ipperwash Beach, three MTFs encountered the former staff of AAF-A, now entirely spectral in nature, engaged in the wholesale massacre of a polar bear swim event. As no such event had ever been held in the vicinity of Site-43, it was later determined that the victims had been killed in precisely this fashion at an event in September 2002 in Iceland. Limited engagement with abatement fluid dispatched the entities with no casualties, but all three MTFs suffered heavy losses when the water level of Lake Huron rapidly rose to meet them and an entity resembling technician Philip Deering began pulling them below the surface one by one. AAF-D was filled with an almost impenetrable red glare and multiple shifting visual dimensions, causing Dr. Blank to lose his balance and attempt to steady himself on a paraspectral grounding circuit. His arm instead passed through it, and he was immediately converted to a large tomato which fell to the ground, bounced into Dr. Lillehammer's path, and was crushed beneath her shoe. She stopped running, looked down at Blank's remains, and was still examining them when all remaining pipes and conduits burst simultaneously, obscuring her from the camera view. She was later found in the same position, transformed at the atomic level into a mannequin constructed from plywood and oil-based paint. SNC discovered that the sealed bulkheads separating archives and revision and applied occultism were buckling, and although the security cameras were no longer transmitting visual data, audio tracks consistent with the percussion of meat and bone and the steady pumping of liquid were received. Theorizing that the transmogrified personnel might still be conceptually human, Del Olmo broadcast wide-spectrum stun memetics to both sections, resulting in the audio ceasing after three minutes. The bulkheads were then sheared open, and SNC personnel armed with abatement fluid hoses and flamethrowers neutralized all remaining personnel within the affected areas, except for Dr. Wirth. In the confusion following all of these events, Dr. Deering confessed to senior site personnel his responsibility for the temporal paradox. While such a paradox would normally have just collapsed and reverted the timeline, 
It appeared that the containment breach at the facility had inexplicably granted an anomalous stability to this alternate reality, which allowed it to persist. The effects of this persistence were continuously felt worldwide, with the societal and economic infrastructures of the general public beginning to collapse within days, as the simultaneous occurrence and experience of multiple sets of conflicting events only worsened with the passage of time. This event and the breach which caused it were classified SCP-001, and Site-43 became the most stable center of human civilization. The remaining researcher staff theorized that SCP-001 had achieved some level of sapience, perhaps acquired from the individuals it had annihilated, and was intentionally preserving the place of its birth from complete destruction. Deering proposed that the creator of the Rhysno Cannon, Placeholder, be located and questioned as to its whereabouts, with the hope that Deering could still fulfill his instructions and revert the paradox breach. Placeholder was retrieved from Site-87 in a state of high paranoia and disarray, and transported to Site-43, having spent the duration of his journey frantically claiming that the authors had left them. When questioned, Placeholder claimed to have no knowledge of a Rhysno Cannon, and when Deering informed him that a future version of him had invented it and passed the information on to his earlier self, Placeholder claimed that no such contact had ever occurred. After extensive deliberation, Placeholder began the attempted construction of the Rhysno Cannon with the assistance of Site-43's Quantum Super Mechanics section. During this time, and across several subsequent breaches, a number of persistent sub-anomalies of SCP-001 became apparent. SCP-001-A is an apparently sapient being dwelling within all reflective surfaces in or around Site-43, resembling former janitorial and maintenance technician Philip Deering. It is wearing his uniform and resembles his appearance at the moment of his death on September 8, 2002, with red skin, burst eyeballs running down its face onto its uniform jacket, and it jerks erratically when it moves. It is almost uniformly hostile to the personnel of Site-43, as any individual coming within range of a reflective object is in immediate danger of violent attack. 001-A attacks have included personnel being pulled bodily through large mirrors without breaking the glass, resulting in their complete loss, personnel being physically scratched and clawed, resulting in serious injuries which fester and do not heal and personnel being pulled bodily through small mirrors without breaking the glass, resulting in their painful dismemberment and typically death. 001-A is capable of manifesting in more than one surface at a time, although its movements are uniform across instances, with the observed upper limit of these instances being 14 separate bodies. It has demonstrated passive behavior when confronted by Dr. Dougal Deering, instead preferring to vocalize. These vocalizations take the form of a monotone litany of Dr. Deering's achievements at the SCP Foundation and his many personal virtues. At no point will the entity look directly at Dr. Deering, and he alone among the personnel of Site-43 cannot hear its vocalizations. All reflective materials at Site-43 have been either made opaque or kept under strict containment procedures to prevent 001-A manifestation. Specialized eye drops developed by the memetics and counter-memetics section prevent 001-A from manifesting on the lenses of human eyes, although these drops must be administered every four hours to remain effective. Manifestation of 001-A on a subject's eyes immediately induces them to burst, and brain death soon follows. 001-B is a cognito-linguistic phenomenon revolving around a string of characters, consisting of the words, Dr. Dougal Deering cannot change the past, interspersed with the numbers 1 through 6. The fact that this string has meaning in English has furthered theories that SCP-001 is a sentient entity attempting to punish the individuals it deems responsible for its creation. 
Each time SCP-001 recurs, a new member of Site-43's personnel acquires a new instance of the string, acquiring its anomalous effect, which is the complete loss of all ability to communicate with other sentient beings. Whenever someone without the effect vocally requests a 001B instance from someone who does, the effect is transferred, with one individual regaining the ability to communicate and the other losing it. Those affected by this phenomenon, known as its keepers, become conceptually vague to others, and as they cannot communicate, they are unable to indicate their status as keepers. The affliction also worsens over time, leading to the complete conceptual invisibility of all long-term keepers. For this reason, detailed records must be kept of who has lost their ability to communicate, and instances of 001-B must be cycled between all personnel to prevent a loss of manpower until the next causal loop resets the effect. The number of 001-B instances increases every time the loop repeats, leading to the memetics and counter-memetics section to propose disposing of one iteration every year by presenting it to Dr. Deering shortly before his scheduled death. This does render him incapable of communication in his final moments, however, appearing to cause him considerable emotional trauma. 001-C is Lake Huron, one of the largest freshwater lakes on Earth, and the only one known to have attained sentience. The lake, which is located near Site-43, is actively hostile to all human life and constructions, and immediately following the initial containment breach, it anomalously increased its pressure level and destroyed all underwater facilities and utilities connected to the site, then began expanding outward beyond the logical limits of its volume. When the surrounding communities, except for Site-43, were abandoned or destroyed, the lake receded to its previous waterline. Any objects coming into contact with the lake are immediately absorbed, and the lake has been known to issue recognizable exclamations of pain when absorbing particularly large or heavy materials. Similarly, the lake on occasion issues cries consistent with those of a Canadian lynx. A significant proportion of the lake now lies beneath Site-43, in the caverns formerly occupied by the now incorporated mythological creatures of the region's anomalous nexus, and so therefore the lake is now in active conflict with 001-D. 001-D is the bedrock surrounding Site-43, which now exhibits evidence of biological and occasionally even sentient behavior. This includes increases and decreases in size consistent with the act of respiration, causing significant damage to the outer membrane of the site's superstructure as well as the periodic absorption of any material coming into contact with it, whether organic or inorganic. Additionally, it emits an opaque liquid substance that triggers hallucinations and uncontrollable depression when visually perceived, and periodically it vocalizes the name Vivian. Over the course of one year, Placeholder, through strenuous experimental development and brute force, developed a functional prototype of the Rhizno Cannon. This is partly due to receiving instructions from his future self during the final days of its construction, with it being assumed that such instructions were not sent further back due to a lack of temporal stability. To compensate for the cannon's enormous energy requirements, however, several site functions were temporarily disabled including acroomatic abatement and security and containment duties. This was predicted to provide enough power for approximately 30 seconds of intertemporal synchronization across a 21-year duration. On September 8th, 2023, Dr. Deering prepared to use the Rhizno Cannon to synchronize with his past self from 2002. He had communicated to site personnel that he no longer trusted the instructions he had been given in 2002, and had no desire to prevent the containment failure that he had prevented in that year. Instead, he intended to instruct his former self to allow the 2002 breach to occur, in the hopes that this would restore the correct version of the timeline. 
After meticulously preparing his instructions, Deering entered the quantum super mechanics section of the site and activated the cannon. Meanwhile, site personnel began to notice a gradual increase in both local anomalous activity and temporal instability. This was first thought to be symptoms of Deering's correction of the timeline, and so these reality alterations were allowed to continue uninhibited until the three sections affected by the original event were anomalously reverted to their 2002 configurations. All personnel killed during that event were spontaneously resurrected, and the containment failure occurred for a second time. Since the site personnel were not prepared for this recurrence, they failed to repeat their actions from the previous year, resulting in the survival of Drs. Blank and Lilyhammer, who had apparently become infused with the energies released during the containment failure. Blank had gained the ability to induce false memories, while Lilyhammer had gained the ability to manifest viral parasitic memes and they used their newfound powers to endanger the mental and physical health of site staff, displaying malicious and isolationist intents for unknown reasons. An image of Dr. Blank was said to be burned into personnel's retinas by Lilyhammer's cognito hazards, and this was determined to not be a figure of speech. Following these events, Dr. Deering was found in the quantum super mechanics section, deceased via self-exposure to a lethal cognito hazard. He did activate the cannon prior to his apparent suicide, and in so doing, likely terminated his prime timeline counterpart prior to his prevention of the 2002 breach. His actions are likely to have prevented the events detailed in this file from occurring in baseline reality, but they should also have resulted in the collapse of this alternate timeline which has so far not occurred. Deering also left a note to explain his actions, which reads, Philip, you might think I don't love you. After what I'm about to do, you might become certain I don't love you. You're never going to hear from me again, and you might not ever know why. I hope that someday, somehow, you'll understand the reasons behind the things that I've done. I suspect our resourceful extra-temporal overlords are already looking over my metaphorical shoulder, hoping this confession will help them to understand what went so terribly wrong in this worst of all possible timelines. They'll probably never let you read this letter. I'm going to maintain the fiction that I'm speaking to you, however, Philip because the idea that my death will mean your life is the only thing keeping me going. I always resented you for my success. Can you think of anything pettier? Me, with my two doctorates and my super-secret laboratory, irritated beyond belief by your laziness and lack of ambition. The more vital I became to the Foundation, the more I hated to imagine my brother pushing a mop down some godforsaken sewer hole, as if having a working man for a brother somehow undermined my own achievements. And then I undermined them myself. Let me tell you the story of my failure. When I received that fateful call from my future self, you didn't even know we were working at the same facility. I'd kept that from you. I didn't want to see you. I didn't want people to know you were my brother. And then that voice started speaking in my head. There were two of me, he and I, I and I, if you like. And he told me that if I didn't do some very specific things very, very quickly, there was going to be a disaster. It was going to kill seven people and leave you a miserable wreck. And twenty years later, I was going to try to relieve you of your burden. And that was going to get you killed. I don't even remember what it felt like, receiving that knowledge. But there's a security camera in my office, so I know what it looks like it felt like. It looks like it felt like someone had told me the entire world was about to end. I wish you could have seen what that knowledge did to me. I wish that was how you could remember me. 
not cold and callous and permanently disapproving, but absolutely terrified at the thought of losing you to a slow decline and a sudden demise. You would have known what you'll never know now, what I didn't know until that moment. I love you, and I could never bear to lose you. I lost you anyway. I did what that damned voice told me to do. I stopped the breach it promised me would ruin your life, would one day take it. I set the decommissioning in motion, and I watched with satisfaction as you took that place apart, pipe by pipe. I was watching when you died. When they all died. And now you're watching me, every minute of every hour of every day. A twisted reflection of you, a mockery of the man you were, a reminder of how stupid a man I was when I dialed in that device and placed a call across the gulf of time. And you know what the best thing is? In 2022, there was a disaster that killed seven more people. Not because I didn't do something this time. Because I did. That's why you're watching me, of course. Because it's all my fault. You're my own personal albatross now, Philip. I don't want to believe it's actually you, of course. The things you've done, the notches you've added to my list of failures, but... More than once, late at night, when the red-rimmed walls close in and I can't sleep and I can't keep my eyes closed against the throbbing in my head, I open my closet door and stand in front of the only remaining mirror in Site 43. And you won't look at me. I've decided it doesn't matter if that is you or not. It's not going to be you for long. I'm going to bring you back. Not for me. Not for anyone else trapped in this endless hell. But for the people at the other end of this forked road. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring all of them back. By making one last mistake to cancel out the very first one. I'm going to put a bullet in the brain of the man who caused this. And you're not going to die in 2002. And you're not going to die in 2022 either. I'm going to write a better story. I can't live without you. But after what I've done to you, I hope you can live without me. Your brother, Dougal. The containment procedures for SCP-001 ensure that each reprise is identical to the original breach, because each reprise is identical with the original breach. They are not reenactments, but are reoccurrences of the historical event, so failing to adhere to the containment procedures will actually change the course of history. As September 8, 2022 recedes further back into the past, the potential for these new realities to diverge further from baseline reality increases exponentially. Each of the personnel killed in 2022, as well as Deering, who died in 2023, and Dr. Ngo, who died in 2027, will be returned to life by SCP-001 60 seconds before the moments of their deaths. They are sapient human beings with physical forms and agency, and will behave as they did before they died so long as their contextual triggers are received. If they are interfered with, however, they may survive to wreak havoc on Site-43, and containment of SCP-001 will have failed. The nine personnel who were not killed by 001 but directly participated in its containment, including Deering, have self-organized into Provisional Task Force Omega-001. They are tasked with replicating their original actions as perfectly as possible, and if they're successful, reality will restructure into a timeline marginally less prejudicial to the survival of the remaining site personnel. While a collapse to baseline reality is theoretically possible, it is not known how many correct containments would be required to achieve this. Further experimentation with containment of 001 has produced mixed results, with an attempt made in 2025 to more effectively orchestrate the containment duties 
by appointing an additional staff member to provide precise time signals and cues. This resulted in the staff member becoming incorporated into SCP-001 as a containing individual. The other members of the task force performed notably less effectively the next year, suggesting that they have become entangled with 001 by virtue of their actions in relation to it, and their competence at handling the anomaly is finite and divided equally between them. After this, all surviving personnel have been forbidden to aid the task force in their containment duties. Dr. Nyo leaves a note here explaining that they continue to do this and persist because there is always hope. Every time they get it right, their lot in life improves, and every step they take towards a more perfect containment of SCP-001 is another step homewards. Even if they never really make it, however, even if they're doomed to live this nightmare out year after year for all eternity, they must take solace in the fact that their actions are ensuring that somewhere across the gulf of multiversal space, another reality is spared the horrors they witness daily. They do this not only for themselves, but they do this for all their selves. On September 8th, 2027, Dr. Wirth was badly injured by 001-A on his way to perform his containment duties, leading to Dr. Nyo attempting to replace him at his post, but arriving late. Confronted by the Prime Thought Form, she was unable to reach the pyroclastic charges, and instead attempted to activate the fire control systems in the section, resulting in a deluge of ectoplasmic material from AAF-D. At the conclusion of the breach event, security and containment agents attempted to rescue her, instead discovering that the entirety of the a r office wing was filled with anomalous objects resembling tape reels, crudely constructed from pig iron. The removal of the reels, 2,128 in total, revealed that Dr. Nyo was not present in the office, and the reels were found to contain several hundred thousand meters of primarily audio tape. 1,322 of the reels contained Dr. Nyo reciting her stream of consciousness during an average day. 324 of them contained her speaking to a silent therapist about invasive, upsetting, guilt-inducing thoughts and dreams she had experienced. 198 reels were of her speaking to said therapist about extremely personal and often graphic traumatic incidents from her life. 184 were of a mocking male voice repeating selections from the preceding 1,844 reels at 10 times speed. 122 contained an extremely fine microfilm featuring further stream of consciousness accounts in film script form covering the majority of Dr. Neo's life, and 98 reels contained screams, some extremely brief, some several hours long, but all identifiable in Dr. Neo's voice. There was one recording of sustained weeping, again identifiable as Dr. Neo's, and finally, one reel with no apparent contents, constructed from Dr. Nyo's nerve and glial cells. All of these reels and the tape they contain are indestructible, with attempts to subject them to acromatic abatement procedures resulting in a toxic gas, which cannot be properly abated, resulting in the deaths of seven junior researchers. An update from a few years later tells us that Dr. Nyo's death has been incorporated into SCP-001, and therefore recurs each year. The tapes are all regenerated, but tapes which have already been created do not disappear. Proposals have been made to dispose of her remains in either Lake Huron or the Bedrock, but the uncertain effects of inadvertently cross-testing these anomalies are a cause for concern. Additionally, Dr. Wirth's removal from archives and revision has been immensely complicated by the appearance of her remains, which badly batter him upon manifestation. It requires around two hours of labor to extricate him, during which his injuries cannot be treated, resulting in him being supplied with body armor to help out. Wirth also reports that Dr. Nyo recognizes him shortly before her death, and expresses confusion and a sense of betrayal when she does so. 
He has been unable to seek counseling for these experiences, as the site now no longer has a qualified therapist. The reel made up of her nerve and glial cells exhibits progressive signs of corrosion which worsen with each occurrence of SCP-001, although the remaining 2,127 reels do not degrade. Dr. Worth leaves a note wondering if she still feels that there's always hope, and for his part, he hopes that she can't feel anything. Placeholder also leaves a note stating that there is a way out of this mess, and he's going to find it. Until that day, he tells them to keep performing their duties, keep up their spirits, and keep drawing breath. On September 8th, 2033, however, Placeholder is reported missing. Chief Mukami writes that for the past year, Placeholder has been highly focused on the construction of a new device, allowing his mental and physical health to decline in the process. He has been incredibly secretive about the intended function of this machine, and when pressed, claimed that he was going to find a way to write a better story. He was last seen by Agent Radcliffe earlier that day while he prepared to fulfill his containment duties, and after successfully ameliorating the breach, Placeholder, the new machine he was constructing, and the Rhizno Cannon were all found to be missing. Surveillance systems in all relevant areas had undergone spontaneous failure, for reasons unknown. The loss of Placeholder does not bode well for any hope of safely collapsing their reality to baseline but if their understanding of SCP-001 holds true, the cannon should temporarily reappear every year so that it can be used by Deering to fulfill his containment duties. A couple of days later, after an extensive search of Placeholder's office, a handwritten note was found containing three words, Paradox Exodus Engine. The last update on the document, posted on September 8th of the following year, just reads, there is no canon. With that, we're given the last document for SCP-5956, this time again from the Prime Timeline. It states that the anomalous effects triggered by ill-considered use of the Rhizno canon, which are categorized as SCP-001 in that other timeline, are analogous to anomalous effects categorized as SCP-5243 in baseline reality. On September 8th, 2002, Site-43 experienced a cascade containment failure scenario, and every year this event recurs as SCP-5243. The affected facilities revert to their 2002 configuration, and any individuals killed by the containment failure are briefly resurrected so that they might reenact their deaths. If any of them do not die in the recurring event, a Class CK restructuring event will occur, changing history so that they did not die in 2002, but instead became suffused with esoteric energy and become irrationally violent. This creates alternate timelines which can only be corrected if the next year's containment failure is handled correctly. SCP-5243 is also responsible for the creation of several secondary anomalies, the containment of which spurred the initial commissioning of the Rhizno Cannon. Simultaneous with the original containment failure in 2002, Dr. Deering perished for unknown reasons, and is restored to life each year by 5243, wherein he always dies in the same mysterious manner. Starting in 2013, however, he survived the events of 5243, for reasons also unknown, and is instead executed annually by MTF personnel, under the assumption that his survival could result in further Class CK events. The Temporal Anomalies Department, however, has identified an incident of concern in an alternate timeline which may help to explain these events and were provided an incident report from said alternate timeline. In it, containment of SCP-5243 is reported to have failed for the fourth time on September 8, 2016, due to the survival of Dr. Del Omo. As an alternate timeline had therefore been created, and as that timeline would inevitably be collapsed by the next successful containment, the annual execution of Dr. Deering became unnecessary. 
Director McInnes ordered that Deering instead be interrogated to determine whether he knew why he had been killed by 5243 every year since 2002 and why it was still resurrecting but no longer killing him. In the interrogation, Deering says that he was sitting in his office when he was contacted by himself from the future, from a soon-to-be-dead timeline, just like the one they're in now. He said that in 2002, something horrible was going to happen to his brother, and that in 2022, it was going to flat-out kill him, with it being Dougal's fault for trying to make things better. He told himself, however, that he could prevent it all, as there was going to be a massive containment breach that would kill seven people and create all sorts of persistent and problematic anomalies. His brother was going to get saddled with one of them for the rest of his life, leading to Ibanez remarking that all Phil Deering got was a mirror monster that calls him names. Dougal says that his future self told him it was much worse than that, and that eventually he would try to fix it, and it would get him killed. But if he stopped that triggered event, none of it would happen. His future self told him that the only way to keep the timeline damage to a minimum was for him to dump the effluence out of AAF-D, stop it from blowing, stop the whole disaster from occurring. And that's what he was trying to do, except he died. This has now happened every single year until 2013, when suddenly they needed to start doing it manually, and Ibanez asks what he thinks could have changed. Another doctor in the interrogation remarks that he did some consultation with Placeholder at Site 87 before this timeline's version of Site 43 lost communication with the wider Foundation. The version of Deering who called their Deering was from a dead timeline, and when that timeline collapsed, his call was set in stone, so it could never not happen. What if, however, there's an alternate timeline that isn't unstable, and has another Deering that's free to call his earlier self every year, over and over, and kill the both of them using the link between them? Ibanez asks why he would do such a thing, to which the doctor says that he would do it to stop their Deering from stopping the breach, as maybe it causes more problems than it's solved. If so, perhaps that ceased to happen in 2013 because something happened to him, or the device that let him make the call. Ibanez, however, wonders why 5243 would be bringing him back every year if it's not responsible for killing him, leading the doctor to suggest that perhaps Deering isn't entangled with 5243, but rather with whatever is going on in the alternate timeline. Deering says that none of that is really a problem, though, as long as they execute him every year. As long as they do that, even if the breach keeps on breaching, his brother isn't going to die in 2022, and he won't be around to do whatever it was that he did. Ibanez asks if that's good enough for him, to which Deering says that it's not, but what matters is that it's good enough for Philip. Alright, so there's a whole heck of a lot going on here, with many parts of it seeming fairly random at a cursory glance. This article does work on its own, with no other reading, but it's also connected to a whole slew of other articles, tales, and characters. Rather than sitting here for hours to summarize the entire overarching canon involved here, let me just try and explain 5956 itself. 5956 is explicitly connected to another SCP, 5243, which is discussed in the final document. SCP-5243 is a cascade containment breach slash unstable time loop that occurs every year in multiple sections of Site-43. Dramatic local reality alterations will revive and subsequently terminate a number of deceased Foundation personnel and damaged containment apparatus throughout the site. This occurs in baseline reality, or the prime timeline, but every time something is done incorrectly in these recurrences, a branching timeline is created. These timelines are effectively doomed, as once the following recurrence is done correctly, the doomed timelines are merged and erased. 5243 was caused by a catastrophic breach in the acromatic abatement section, and is obviously a pretty bad thing for the Foundation, 
in large part due to it continually damaging all of the equipment and facilities at Site-43 on an exponential basis. The real problems that we just read all about, however, are due to Dr. Dougal Deering, who did a bad thing for a good reason. Placeholder made a device called the Rhizno Cannon that allows someone to make a connection with their past self. The how and why of this construction is a ball of worms I won't really get into here. In 2002, right before the containment breach, Dougal is contacted by his future self thanks to the Rhizno Cannon, telling him that he needs to prevent the breach from occurring by dumping the effluents out of the facility. Doing this will prevent 5243 from occurring, saving a number of lives, including eventually his brothers. In doing so, however, he created a branching timeline that resulted in the Rhizno Cannon not being created, thus creating a hell of a paradox. This paradox would have normally resulted in the catastrophic restructuring of universal reality, but thanks to all of the esoteric material still in facility AAF-D, it instead created a super-powered version of the various anomalies in and around Site-43, which ends up repeatedly killing a number of individuals similar to 5243. This doomed timeline really wants a way out of all this, so they make Placeholder build the Rhizno Cannon to try and undo everything. Dougal, rather than trying to convince his past self to let the breach happen, simply used a lethal cognito hazard to kill both his present self and past self, preventing SCP-001 from occurring in baseline reality. This effect should have also collapsed the Paradox timeline, but it didn't, leading to the group of personnel continuing to have to enact 001 each year, including Dougal using the Rhizno Cannon. In 2033, however, Placeholder and the Rhizno Cannon disappeared, apparently using a Paradox Exodus engine he created to escape this doomed timeline. They had hoped that the Rhizno Cannon would temporarily reappear each year so that they could continue enacting 001 properly, but it didn't, so they're pretty doomed. Without the cannon, Dougal couldn't contact his past self, 21 years in the past, to kill them. So in 2013, in baseline reality, Dougal didn't die during 5243. Now the foundation of baseline reality just shoots him every year to prevent any further shenanigans. But in an alternate timeline, created due to 5243 being reenacted improperly, they managed to interview Dougal. During the interview, it's suggested that perhaps Dougal isn't intertwined with 5243, but rather something else, that being SCP-001. Dougal, however, is glad to be shot every year over and over as part of keeping SCP-5243 going, so long as it means his brother will be alright. To summarize everything then, Dougal tried to mess with time to prevent a disaster, but in doing so he created a horrible paradox that resulted in a horrific fate for his brother. Now, to make sure that his brother is relatively safe, with only a minor anomaly attached to him, he's perfectly happy to be killed over and over again. In other words, he fought time, and time won. Obviously, like I said, there's a lot more going on here than just what's on the surface, with Placeholder especially being a highly involved character, but the story here is still a good one. Once you start involving time manipulation and pataphysics, things can go off the rails pretty quickly and easily. But at its core, this was still a story about a man who loves his brother and was desperate enough to try and change the past to save him. While he himself ended up in a worse position than he started, his heart was at least in the right place. <laughs>